From Microbe TV, this is Immune, episode number 12, recorded on September 18th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Good morning. (laughs) Yes, it's 8.30 in the morning, (laughs) which is... (laughs) We usually record in the afternoon, a little different this time. I don't know if I've ever recorded at 8.30 in the morning, maybe at some (laughs) ASM meeting, which is always insane. Ah. Also joining us from Worcester, Ohio, Steph Langle. Hey there. Good to be back. Wasn't on for the last one. Um, Thankfully, I appreciate you two carrying on without me. It was a great podcast. We missed you. And I missed you. (laughs) Yeah, I was in, well, just um, uh, having to run to a last minute meeting about my dissertation, which I am heavily editing and going through. I'm sure you all familiar and sympathize with all of your students. So that's kind of my current situation. Do you have a defense scheduled? I do. It's on Halloween. (laughs) It's October 31st. Yes. Cool. I I joke. I maybe should walk into my presentation with some type of mask or, you know, witch's hat or something. A a face mask like you would wear in the lab. Yeah. Yeah. I have to tell you, I did something yesterday, which was really cool. I went to my alma mater, Mount Sinai, where I got my PhD. And they decided to do a, a lab coat ceremony for the new PhD students. Oh, now, really? Now, everyone may oh. know that medical students get to do a white coat ceremony. That's right. In their first year where they're given their short white coats and they take the Hippocratic Oath and their parents are there. And, you know, it's a nice thing. And at Sinai, they decided to do this for PhD students, which I think is a great idea. Apparently, they're the first to do that in New York and there are only a few in the country to do it. And they asked me to do the keynote for this Aww. first one because I was a student there 43 years ago. <laughs> and I had a lot to say, of course, about what to do and all that. But it was really cool. And then after a few talks, they brought them up on stage and they had what they call a coding ceremony, right? Someone behind them, a faculty, would put the coat on them, just like in the white coat ceremony. Uh And I think they liked it. You know, you would think PhD students are all jaded and they don't need that (laughs) kind of thing. But they need to be celebrated, too. And the dean talked and everything. So I want to say out there, if you're a director of a graduate program somewhere, think about it because it was really cool. And then they got lab coats with their name on it and, you know, Icon Sinai School of Medicine or whatever it is. And I thought it was great. That's I, cool. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I think that would really get people jazzed up and excited. And if you said they're first years? First year, yeah. Yeah, the jading doesn't really start to like the third year. <laughs> so I think, I think first year is perfect timing. You know, Do they it, also take an oath to uh, be a, a oh, they took, scientist? Totally. They took an oath, really? which, which is That's lovely. Great. And I have a copy of it, which I'm going to share because it was oh, beautiful. Definitely. And they also made the PIs take an oath, right? Ooh. To do certain things. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> wow. And, I like you know, so I'm going to put them both online so people can look at. But... Um, I just think it's, uh, you know, I remember showing up as a PhD student and nobody seemed to care. <laughs> right. I do. Right. <laughs> They're like, oh, you're a new student in the lab? Oh, hi. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> bench is over there. <laughs> yeah, that's your bench. Pipette. Pipettes are here. Yeah. And so I think it helps. And they were excited. And they even gave plaques to the students who had picked a lab. Right. And so they came up too and they gave them a little plaque saying, I'm joining this lab. So it was really a nice ceremony. I think it's a great idea and people should try it. And they call it the lab coat ceremony. And the funny thing is when they, <laughs> when they put the coats on, they call it coating. <laughs> <laughs> coating. I can't help think of coating a plate with antibodies. Or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so that's what I did yesterday. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Cindy, how are things going for you? You deep in classes, research? Oh, yes. The classes have started in earnest, and it's a lot of fun. Um, some really great students. Um, I, the the big veterinary uh, immunology class starts next week, so we've been planning all that. I know all the lectures are ready, but yeah, the basic immunology class has been going. Their first exam is uh, Thursday. So wow. Cool. Third of the semester is gone. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I'm, already lo- I'm already looking towards next semester because that's when I yeah. teach and I'm starting to plan because it'll be here in no time, right? 
It will. It will. It comes fast. Yes. But here we are getting these hurricane remnants today. <laughs> it's oh, yeah. It's rainy, 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 rainy and yeah. foggy. But it's really humid. It's great. I love it. It is. <laughs> oh, that's right. You like that. I love the hot I don't mind the heat. Thing. I don't like the humidity, though. Yeah. All right. So as everyone knows who's listening, we are on kind of a rotating schedule. And whose turn is it today? It's Steph's turn. Yes. Today's my turn. And, you know, I've been going through a lot of papers recently in the past couple months of uh, my literature review and preparing for my defense. And there was one paper that stuck out at me, both for its complexity and interest. And it's a field that, you know, scares me a little bit. I think it's good to dive into fields that scare you a little bit. Um, But this really falls into the field of systems biology. And what systems biology is, it's using computational mathematical modeling to model complex biological systems. So, I I mean, systems biology of the concept has been around for a long time, but not until recently because of the technology has systems immunology become more on the forefront in terms of ways that we can measure and look at the immune system and kind of model what's happening and predict what might happen in the future. And so really up until this point, and, and there's, you know, different groups who have done this, but an overall perspective of immunological research is a more reductionist approach. So you take one gene out, you see what happens to this mouse. You take these cells in culture, you treat them with the toxin, you see what happens. And and this is obviously super valuable and you can learn a lot, but it's not looking at the entire system of immunology within the context of the host, which obviously is innumerably complex. And so what systems immunology's goal is to take as many measurements as possible and then to kind of coordinate them using mathematical modeling and bioinformatics. And I don't know, I think, Vincent, you've talked about it before. What do you call those people? I guess bioinformaticians or... Computational 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 biologists. Biology. Okay, perfect. I like that too. Um, But over the course of this podcast, we've talked about many different types of immune cells and cytokines and molecules, but it's only really scratched the surface. So if you think about, I think there's how many uh, clusters of differentiation now, Cindy, over 300 or Mm, so? Not sure. Yeah, over 300, hundreds of cytokines. So, you know, you're trying to determine how to wrangle that and get it uh, down to something less complex, predictable, and and really watching these things change over time in individuals and within a population. So that's what systems immunology is, is looking at that systems moving over time. And so there have been a few technologies that have been developed that have helped get to where we are at now. And you know, we know most of the major cell types. So we found this out out by microscopy, immunohistochemistry, monoclonal antibodies are huge in developing one antibody uh, against one epitope on one surface receptor. And then by putting a fluorochrome on the antibody, you can use things like flow cytometry to um, see what that phenotype of that cell is. Uh, We've done functional studies in mice, humans, I use pigs, and you can then look at cells within the context of a disease, um, both pathogenic or maybe autoimmunity. And then there's been obviously genomic approaches where you're looking at genomic changes to see what a different phenotype represents if a different gene changes in in, in, a, in an individual. So we've had a lot of technologies that have brought us to where we're at today. But the biggest thing that has been a hole in this type of research is single cell analysis. And the reason why single cell analysis, first of all, is a very hot topic right now. I think you say single cell in any seminar and you're going to get a lot more people into that room wanting to hear what you do. And it's because it's very new and we can look at... so. Potentially, the surface receptors that we look at could be redundant. So, for instance, if you have one surface receptor on one cell type and another, but those two populations may not behave the same based on maybe their transcriptome or whatever interaction they're having with an antigen. And so, looking on a single cell level, then you can start to look at these different things like DNA, RNA methylations, chromatin modification, 
all there's many, many different ways you can look at it. But by looking at single cell, then you can start to model what that one cell does within a population. And then you're combining different measurements together to then create your model and and maybe depict what your current experiment is looking at. And, you know, sometimes when we talk about these technologies, it can be difficult for the audience to kind of grasp because I'm using just kind of big terms, modeling, algorithms, you know. So I there's just a couple technologies I'll go through more in depth to kind of give you a sense of from X to, you know, from A to Z, what would we be doing to then t- get that result and put it in a mathematical model, which of course I'm not a computational biologist that would, I would pass that off to somebody else. But let's say um, I'm, you know, working with the cells or the animals, what technologies do I use? So we've described flow cytometry before in this podcast, multicolor flow cytometry. Now within our lab, we have, well, we used to have a six color flow cytometer. We did have a laser go out, but right now we only have four and that's pretty on the low end of capabilities in terms of flow cytometers and many medical centers, cancer centers. I mean, you can have up to uh, eight to 12 colors that you... Oh, I think you can have more than that. I think we have one that'll do 20, yeah. Yeah, 20, 20. I don't use all that, but there are some (laughs) that do. (laughs) Yeah, and the goal is you're trying to, on one cell, measure the most the greatest capacity of surface receptors to define those rare subtypes of cells or how they're changing over time. And you can combine that actually with intracellular staining. So you can fix the cells and look at the activate uh, action of some um, kinases or transcription factors, um, their activation status as well. So you can combine the surface markers with intracellular things as well. Or you can also look at what cytokines they're making. So there is some power there. Um, and so you can you can look at different populations of cells, but you can't really um, hammer down onto an individual cell basis. Yes, exactly. And that's a great point. Thank you about the intracellular. We do some intracellular staining in our lab, especially when we look at cell cultures and we treat the culture with, uh, let's say, like LPS or another toxin. And then we look at intracellular cytokine. Um, we stain that and try to see what's upregulated. And so, yeah, it can be powerful. But of course, you're limited in terms of how, there's just there's only so many colors that you can use on antibodies to stain the cells, both on the surface and intracellular. And the other problem with that is when you're using colors, it's a fluorochrome. So there's a spectrum of color that's emitted and there's overlap. And to deal with that overlap, we do something called compensation where we are looking to just subtract the overlap to look at just one cell population based on that color. But it, it limits our ability because of that overlap. And so one of the big things that's being used is something called mass cytometry. And really, it's just you're combining two different technologies, mass um, flow cytometry and elemental, elemental mass spectrometry. And so by doing that, you are then looking um, basically taking antibodies and you're putting um, your you're using them as probes, but you're coupling them with heavy metal isotopes. And by measuring something by its mass, you can take different isotopes and then see what the mass of that particular isotope is that's bound to the cell that you then run on something called um, time of flight cytometry. So CYTOF is uh, kind of the shorthand. And so you can then look at more, there's up to, gosh, in this paper, we're going to talk about 40 different um, mass, uh, 40 different antibodies that you can put on an isotope to determine different cell types. And so by using that, you don't have to worry about the spectral overlap with flow cytometry, because again, um, you're using um, mass to create these single cell suspensions and, and put in the mass cytometer and then get signals that you can then integrate um, into single cell events. Have you guys had any experience with No, mass? but I was going to ask you. I haven't you, used it. Ha- I guess the machine is more expensive, right? Because you've got to have yeah. a, a mass spec plus a flow, right? Yeah. Hmm. Yes, definitely more expensive. I believe probably in core facilities is where you'd find these and that yeah, you would, yeah. you know, 
one, you know, the nice thing with flow cytometry, especially with the cheaper ones, you can, as an individual lab, have your own. I don't think that that's the case for these. I've not used them, but I'd imagine that that would be true. You know, it's a good point to make a core facility for those who don't know it is something shared, basically. So you have a piece of equipment that's really too expensive for one lab. Most labs, there are always some labs that can afford anything, but right. you share it. And that is great, but it comes with its own issues, right? Because the machines yep. break. Typically, you need a, an operator, so you have to pay them. And if it breaks, then everyone's schedule gets messed up. Sometimes people break the machine because they don't use it properly. So, you know, it's like everything else. It has its issues, its pluses and minuses. Like we have a core flow cytometry facility. And every day we get an email saying, sorry, the software is down. This is down. That's down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I think, like you said, there's definitely a benefit to being in large institutions because you can have those types of things. But I mean, if it's not well run and so, I mean, yeah, that's I the could... key here, you know, if a core facility, the key is a really good person to run it. They are like gold. And that's a career in itself. If you're really a tinkerer and you like to just sit in a room and work on an instrument, it's for you. Because if you get to be really good, you'll be in demand and people will want you to run their facility and have fewer problems. So, Yeah, I was thinking about a way of, you know, we talk a lot about careers that maybe you're not going to be a PI, but if you can define yourself as being very good at one thing, just like you said, I mean, there's a lot of career. I, I would imagine that there would be a lot of career opportunities for somebody who is reliable and is the mass cytometry person or yeah. XYZ. I think you also have to, though, um, still be willing to keep up um, with new technologies because if you're really good at um, facts sorting, for example, and now people are switching over to this type of uh, approach to do their analyses, then you can become obsolete after a certain amount of time. Sure, sure, sure definitely. And I know within Columbia, if you're running a facility and you're really good, often another department will steal you away and pay you more. That's true. Right? <laughs> so. That's true. <laughs> and I wonder, do you, I don't know, in, in our vet college, but It'd be worthwhile if there's a degree, maybe, you know, you're in science, but you're specializing in the equipment, the technologies. But then again, like you said, Cindy, you don't want to learn one technology. You want to be adaptable and learn many. So no, I don't are, know. I'm there thinking are, of There are master's training programs. Undergrad. There are master's programs, but, you know, like biotechnology master's programs where mm -hmm. part of it is learning how to use equipment and the theory behind it. And, you know, you don't want to be a PI. You, you want to have a master's and get a job. And you can go to industry. You can go to academics. And you can, as long as you keep up, yeah. And, uh, you know, in, in five years, a new machine will come out, right? Like this one, Cytoff, right? What didn't exist at one point, it's out. Right. And if you are interested in keeping up, and uh, you can have a very challenging career for sure. So that, yeah, so mass cytometry, it's, it's used in the paper we're talking about. I think in combination with other technologies, it's one of the most popular in terms of systems immunology just because of the capacity to look at a lot more markers in a more defined way and, and how they change. So the other things that I'll just bring up, I mean, there's single cell RNA sequencing or SRNA seq, and you know, when we look at transcriptome profiling, we would then we would initially combine a bunch of cells. But what this does is just take a single cell, and and if you can identify a transcript that is associated with a particular phenotype, you can move to functional studies and maybe knock out that transcript in a mouse model or whatever model you want, and then see what happens. And so, by combining these different types of um, technologies, that's when we start to get a lot of data a lot of data points. And then really after the experiment, learning how to harness them is another challenge to this type of systems in the analogy. And what's interesting about this approach though, is that when you do um, a, a, a population analysis, you do an RNA sequencing, which is just taking a population of cells and look at what genes they're they're making at that particular time, making uh, what mRNAs they're making, which is a marker of what proteins they're making. 
Um, and so you get this on a population basis, but you don't know, for example, whether there's more of one cell type or a, a one cell type is making more of something, but there's fewer of them. You can't really discriminate that. But when you can take an individual cell and do that, then you can use the massive computing capacity to see if there are groups of cells that fall out that you didn't know existed before or express certain markers, but then have certain different functional profiles. So there's just a lot more fine analysis that you can do this way that you can't do with the traditional approaches, which I think is really cool. Definitely. And, you know, I, the aspect of it that I get excited about is something that I, they've termed systems vaccinology. And so you're looking then at single cells responding to an antigen. You're trying to see what the BCR, I'm sorry, B cell and T cell receptors, how they're interacting with that antigen, what's being upregulated downstream from that receptor. And you can apply this to aging, cancer, autoimmunity. I mean, in the terms of immunology, there are so many different avenues that you can take this systems approach. And I think I, the overall goal is generating this detailed census, a spatial map of all the immune cell types and all the immune cell interactions. I mean, it's not that, that in itself is obviously not an easy thing to do, but I think that's the goal. That's what we're there. You know, what this approach is working towards um, and of course, there are some impediments when you're thinking about these type of technologies. Obviously, single cell technology, it's, there's been a big boom, I guess, in the last five to eight years in terms of mass cytometry, the ability to do this high quantity, high dimensional data. Um, so keeping up with that and then the amount of data that comes out of that, you have to have experts that can deal with those, that amount of data. And so what this approach is going to need, it's not going to need cowboy science, people working in individual labs, working on one problem. It's going to need this integrated approach with multiple labs and multiple PIs working together. Uh, just because it, it takes that many high skilled, um, sk high skilled experts to do this type of work. So, you know, I think we're really, when it comes down to it, like the psychology of people and how you can get them <laughs> to work together is how this field is going to move forward. So I guess with that, do you guys have any questions before I mm. hop along to the paper? No, I don't think so. Okay. Sure. Have you dealt with any of this type of big data before where you're collaborating with someone? And I've done some RNA-seq, uh, but not, not on this, not anywhere near this scale. Sure, sure. No, I have not. Um, I'm not sure why, but, you know, my lab is tiny at the moment. We certainly do RNA-seq. But you know, this is much more than that, obviously. Right. And I could do, I could see situations where it would be useful, but uh, sure. I have, I don't have any plans. I'm trying to simplify my lab. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to. My lab make is it more uh, is at the end, you know, five years maybe, and I want to work on some simple. I mean, systems biology certainly can be extremely useful, but there's also a place for very focused experiments like Definitely. Steph mentioned earlier. And I think one of the problems is with a lot of people who do systems biology is they think it's the only way to go. <laughs> and they are very, yes. very vocal, very opinionated people. And I don't think there's ever one way to go in science. Definitely. There are multiple definitely. ways. So. Yeah, I think it's a it's a massively descriptive um, analysis that starts to touch on some mechanism at a very general level. But yeah, you know, interrogating individual proteins and and things is it just it can't be done at that level. So I think they're complementary approaches for sure. Definitely, and you know that's a great point because all of the basis of information that they use in this paper I'll talk about came from studies where you're you're looking at one protein, one gene, and to look really at the function of those things and the questions that are asked at the end, again, that's what we're going to need. So I like to think of it, I mean, as somebody who doesn't do this type of work, I, I guess it can be used as a tool. Like you guys said, it doesn't have to be the end all be all, but I didn't, I don't really interact with a lot of people in this field. So that's interesting to know that that's, that's pretty funny. You know, what I think is a really interesting thing is, so an approach like they use in this paper, because we'll start talking about it in a moment, is that they they look for a bunch of different proteins that are expressed or not expressed or cytokines that are secreted or not secreted. But in reality, they would not know 
which markers to look at and analyze had there not been a lot of groundwork laid down before they got to this approach. Totally. So while, uh, you know, Vincent's point is that the, you know, the systems biology people are always like, this is the, the end all be all. But reality is they would, they wouldn't have anything to analyze if there weren't the groundwork laid by basic science experiments. Definitely. I mean, and still you take the results and you want to say, what's the role of this protein going up? And you look at it, right? It leads to focused right. experiments. And for people to say it doesn't, it's just wrong. We've had people come to Columbia and give talks and say, you don't need hypothesis-driven research anymore. This is all you need. And that's really? not, it's not right. It's simply not yeah. right. And to be, to be extremist in any way is often not right, right? You have to m mix everything together. So I view the beauty of these systems approaches as saying, oh, look, there's this group of proteins that go up, this group goes down. Then you have to figure out what it means because you're always, it's a correlation when you do, when you do these big experiments, right? That's right. Sure. Yeah. Great. So, um, well, I'll start with the paper then. So the, the title is Stereotypic Immune System Development in Newborn Children. The authors, I'll go by last, well, should I? I guess I'll say all, all of them. Um, Axel Olin is the first author. Ewer Hankel, Yang Chang. Uh, let's see if I can, Tata Pali. Oh, gosh. You guys. Lakshmikanth. Lakshmikanth. Ah, uh, great. Christian Pau, Jerome Mikes, Anna Gustafson, Anna Berhardson, Chang Zhang, Kaja Bolin, and Peter Broden is the main, is the PI of this paper. And so they're all at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. And so what they were looking at was collecting blood from children to try over the course of the first three months of life, both cord blood and then week one samples, week four samples and week 12. And they're looking at these infants over time with the goal of trying to identify um, differences in cell populations and plasma protein um, concentrations to try to see how they move and shape over time. And I think one of the impressive things that they did was to adapt their system, their technology to dealing with as little as 100 microliters of blood. So the problem a lot of times with these type of studies is you don't, when you're working with humans, you don't have the opportunity to get large quantities of blood and it, you have to try to deal with the circumstances of the hospital. And so they describe that their systems approach, they take at least 100 microliters of blood. Um, they had 100 newborn children and they had part, of, um, half of them were preterm and the other half were term. And so not only are they looking at just healthy children, they're looking at children who were born preterm three months early compared to ones that were born term. And, and really why they focus on three months is there's previous literature demonstrating that really the first three months of life, there are these changes and maybe that the immune system, I don't really like this way of describing it, but becomes set. It, it reaches an adult phenotype by the time you become three months of age. And so there's this window of opportunity where anything that's transferred from the mother postnatally in terms of um, waning antibodies from the placenta or in milk. And then by the time the microbiome starts to ramp up in these children, there's these huge changes. And so that's what they're looking at, these 100 infants. And the two technologies that they use, one of them I described, mass cytometry, and in the paper, they do give, they have these tables where they list all the different types. So within the mass cytometry, I think there were 38 um, different antibodies they use to create 48 different cell clusters. And so those cell clusters fall into some of the known cell types that we know about, B cells, T cells, neutrophils, monocytes, and natural killer cells. And, and what's really nice about these type of papers, I think when you read them, they're visually beautiful. I mean, when, when you look at the graphs, the different colors they're using to try to define these populations of cells, it's just, it's appealing to the eye. So it's kind of fun to read in that sense. And, and so the other thing they do is um, plasma protein concentrations um, in the blood, but they do it in a particular way to look at o over 200 um, different proteins. And they do it by taking oligonucleotides that are coupled to antibodies with overlapping sequences. So so what happens is these oligonucleotides then can bind to proteins in the sample. And when the antibodies are brought in close proximity to each other, they bind the target, but the sequences overlap. And, and then when they overlap, then you can create a PCR 
target and then you can quantify that with PCR and take those values and, and then be able to see many different proteins based on um, the nucleotide sequence that you're targeting. So those were the two main types of measurements they used, and it can create huge numbers of data, and then they try to distill it throughout the paper. So I'll go through some of the main results. We can talk about them. I probably won't go into in depth with the um, statistical analyses just because I don't know, you know, I, I don't know if our audience really needs to know all of that information. I'm sure you can dig into the paper if you're statistically inclined. Um, so yeah, I think I'll move and on to the and results. If it's you guys, op- it's yes. open access, so everybody. Can yeah, it is. No. This, this did get a lot of press, so there's also a lot of articles written about it if you're interested. So do you think they biased themselves somewhat in the fact that, so they, they did 50 preterm, they, they were very specific to say this is very preterm because it is uh, less gestation of less than 30 weeks, um, which is 10 weeks less than the normal gestation. And I know I, I had a preemie at 32 weeks and that was pretty traumatic. So less than 30 weeks is really, really early. And comparing that to a normal birth, um, just, you know, from my experience, having an infant in the hospital for multiple weeks in the NICU versus a baby that you take home, you know, after a couple of hours or a day, um, it's quite different. Yeah, I would imagine that that, you know, I don't, maybe it was to do that's just the samples they were able to get because I'm not sure, but I, maybe they were selected because of that. That is a really good point. It would definitely, if you're going to see differences in preterm that you would most likely see them if they're that early, I would imagine. So what the first thing that they really describe is they wanted to look at the cord blood of preterm versus term. And they looked obviously either immune cell populations or plasma protein concentrations um, over just in cord blood. And and already they start to see these differences. So when you plot the preterm cord blood, the median of those plasma concentrations, by the term blood um, con- median, median concentrations, you you start to see different um, different things that fall out. So the two things that they mention are two pro-inflammatory uh, markers, CXCL11, which is a, ke- a, a chemokine that's involved in um, pro- pro-inflammatory responses, and then IL-8, which is a, a T-cell cytokine that they've demonstrated to be important in preterm um, infants. And then the other set, so that they're more upregulated in preterm. And, and they talk about how if you have these pro-inflammatory markers, of course, preterm birth is associated with inflammation. Um, and then on the other side, the one thing they identified was leptin, which is, um, it's a, hor- a, a fat hormone essentially. So those babies, if you have more leptin, you're more likely to, to weigh more, which term babies would. And they do a variety of um, multidimensional scaling analysis. And, and really what they're coming up with is their large differences in preterm versus term cord blood and the way um, that the phenotypes of the cells and the profiles space out when you, when you do these type of um, analyses, looking at just, dip, you're visualizing the levels of similarities of individuals. And, and by using the, these ordination techniques, then you can kind of see how these uh, look over time. So they wanted to also confirm, because of course, you know, you have a preterm versus a term baby that are different in these things you're looking at. Well, what they want to make sure that, well, what's, it could just be that the baby is older, really. At that time, the, the, the term baby is three months older. So they took preterm um, babies and they measured them three months later and they are still different. So meaning that they retain the differences over time, even at age matched um, time points. So that's, the cord blood. So what they do then is they move on and they wanted to look at the ability to correlate cord blood analysis of plasma protein concentrations and immune cell frequencies um, to the peripheral, peripheral blood one week and they take a couple infants at four weeks. And there's not a lot of correlation. So, so they do look at, there's about six immune cells that correlate, that cord blood correlates with um, peripheral blood. And when you look at plasma protein, there's only one um, protein that actually correlates. And so what they're suggesting is that cord blood may not always be an appropriate marker for correlating neonatal development over time. And I think a lot of times that had been done because you can get cord blood fairly 
easy, I'd imagine, compared to trying to follow infants out over time. And so this paper demonstrates that that might be not be the best way to go when looking at immune development, trying to take cord blood and correlate that because there really was not a lot of things correlated. I think some of the things were CD8 T cells, um, naive and memory B cells, and then one TNF family. Um, I think that tra- that uh, the plasma protein that that is associated with, uh, oh gosh, um, tacky and B cells. I think Cindy. I don't know if you mm-hmm. tacky is associated with with um, B cell isotype switching. So that was yeah. correlated, but that's really all there was. Um, and then they went ahead and and did this phenotypic analysis, and because you can look at the changes in phenotype populations, and they did something pretty neat visually. It's called sto- stochastic neighbor embedding. And when you get this data, it's very high dimensional and they're, they're trying to distill it into two dimensions. So you're looking at this plot and, and it's just measuring the consequence of the different phenotypes and how they are different from one another. And they changed drastically from cord blood again to one week in blood. So further demonstrating that cord blood may not be appropriate and that you have this, this change in phenotypes in, over time. In neonates. I find when I'm looking at these things that it, you know, you get so far f- removed from the primary data that sometimes it's very hard to get in your head exactly what you're looking at. I mean, you can clearly see there's differences, you know, oh yeah, yeah, I see that shape is different than that shape or those dots are more spread than those dots. But kind of conceptually getting all of the information that they're compiling and analyzing together and thinking, oh, okay, I get what that picture means is sometimes ch- challenging even for those of us who are, you know, immunologists who've been in this for a while and understand all these cells and cytokines. Yeah, definitely. I, and you know, the, the, they, I think because there's so much data, even the figure legends, they don't really do justice as to what they're showing you in the graph. And so, yeah, you can look at these pictures and say, okay, I mean, that they look, the spatial map, I, it looks different. I, I get the point that they're getting across, but kind of the intricate details, maybe you wouldn't be able to pick up. And it's something like, you know, what, what Vincent's saying, you know, when you do this reductionist approach and you analyze these individual things, there's probably enough data in this one paper, if you had access to the primary data, that would keep uh, an individual busy for an entire career just yeah. from collecting from those two things with all of the massive amounts of different combinations of things that you could analyze. It's just, it's staggering. That, it is staggering. And that is a key, is a point that we should make that the data need to be posted somewhere that everybody could see them so that you know the authors can't hide all the primary data and that is a drive that that's a movement called open data right where yeah you don't just publish the paper but all the data points the numbers that went into each one goes somewhere on a server Um, and i don't know if that's the case here but many people are doing that of course yeah, and you know, I was going to bring this up at the end, but I'd be interested in your opinion. You know, when you're when you're asked to be a reviewer for one of these papers, I don't know. I mean, because you can't run all of their models with all of their original data to check. So how? I I, I just oh, thinking that's a of great it from, point. That's a great point. I don't know how you do that. Oh, in the old days, and most most reductionist papers, you can get your head around it. You could look at the gels or whatever, but here. You can't because you'd have to run all the the software packages yourself to make sure that their conclusions are correct. You just can't do it. So reviewing these papers is very difficult. And to a certain extent, you're taking it on faith that they're right. But you know how it goes that you publish something and if there's a problem it'll and it's worth looking at, it'll get revealed at some point. Right. And and maybe with only so many people who really can understand the depths of this, maybe that wouldn't be identified. So I, it, it's an interesting point when moving forward with these type of, an, of, of papers and this well, field. You know, the thing is that how much time would you have to spend on this paper to review it fairly? It would have take, you been to read it? Uh, I have no idea. It would take a long time, more than most people are willing to spend. And that's a case for putting things, putting a paper on a server and letting the community make comments. Right. Yeah. You know, bioarchive is great for that. People say, oh, this figure is not done right. And then you know, the authors can fix it or whatever. You crowdsource the review because otherwise I don't know how you could review this properly because it would just take you too long. Right, right. Mm. So I'll move on to the next. This would be and then the next figure, but kind of really this touches upon the title of this paper, the stereotypic immune development in neonates. And 
I, I do like the way that they're showing us. Um, so they're, they're taking something called topological data analysis or TDA. And, and what they're doing is they're combining all the, di- the different parameters they looked at. So then they have to, of course, because they have different units, they're going to normalize that data. They're going to put it in a similar unit so that the variance isn't as wide because they're different parameters. And then they're going to just look at how those parameters within an individual, how they are different from another. And so with this analysis, when you're looking at it, you can actually define different phenotypes and how they congregate. And so I'm looking at this hmm, landscape of different nodes and each node represents a whole cluster of parameters. And, and, you can see, and if you go to the paper, they, there's two different populations at birth. So, mm-hmm. so they're organizing this from day zero to day 100. And so on the left is day zero. And there's these two very different populations. And in, and in this, the first showing is you don't really know what those two different populations are. But okay, we can kind of think back. They measured 50 preterm and 50 term. We can kind of uh, hypothesize what these two different populations are. But what happens is the differences in the populations, come, they, they decrease. So meaning they become more similar. And, and it, over time, there's actually this funneling this this funneling phenotype where they they all come together and by day 100 after birth they are very similarly congregated together which within this TDA analysis just means that they are more similar than less similar and so this is what speaks to their title stereotypic development because even though there's these two populations that are very different they actually converge together along a same developmental path to by 100 days to look similar based on all the parameters that they looked at. When they then define preterm versus term, of course, the two big populations at day zero that were so different in cell populations was preterm versus term. And the thing though is they even, so they converge together at the end. So even if you have, you know, a preterm baby has experienced a very different reality than a term baby, but yet their immune cells come together in the same trajectory and they have very similar phenotypes and types of cells by the time they reach 100 days, which, as I mentioned before, all of this blood data is very different from cord blood. So in this little TDA analysis, you can see cord blood is so far removed from from the, the blood cells. But the stereotypic development means that even if you have these different experiences, they're coming together. And so what does that mean? These are questions that we can ask, of course, with our reductionist approaches. But that's one of the main things that they identified in this paper. And they go on to try to talk about, okay, what are the cell types that are doing this? Neutrophils and T cells, they are converging together. Um, even things like leptin that I described before, which was higher in babies that were termed probably because they're chunkier, that protein concentration that even converges once they become 100 days. So a lot of these things are actually moving together on a a similar developmental path, um, which I found interesting because it it kind of speaks to you wonder, you know, can preterm babies, do they end up in a similar place as term babies? And and what does that mean for them in terms of a, a future, future health? So I, what I wonder is, you know, you go through all of this and I'm not saying it's not beautiful, but don't, don't we already sort of know this? I mean, if there were problems with preterm infants, wouldn't, wouldn't it be like a major thing that we would know about these days that, oh yes, they're absolutely always the rest of their life, much more susceptible to things. Wouldn't we have predicted this, that eventually they catch up and that they, they have very similar immune systems to everyone else? Sure. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that there is previous data demonstrating this, but I do wonder, do we even have information on preterm vaccine responses in terms of individual population level um, responses over time? I haven't looked that up, but I would imagine so. Sure, sure. So yeah, um, you're right. It is interesting, but maybe maybe this is something that could have been predicted, kind of like maybe there's a lot of showboating here. I don't know, in terms of uh, you can present it very aesthetically pleasing. And it almost is like, Hey, look at this data. We already know. 
So I kind of look at this, maybe, maybe Vincent has a thought on this. It's like, I remember when two photon microscopy came out and everybody was so excited. We could see the, the immune cells moving around in the lymph node and, oh, look at all this stuff we learned. And basically what we learned was what had been shown with other traditional experimental approaches over many, many, many years. And it validated that visually. And there were lots of cool things that we could ask that we couldn't see otherwise. Sure as people got used to the technology. But for the first, you know, couple of years, it was just like, oh, okay, yeah, that's really cool. And we can make music to it. And we can see these cells dance around and they're different colors. And yeah, basically we show that, you know, if you have antigen there, the antigen presenting cells and the T cells interact. Or, you know, there were lots of experiments like that, that I, you know, we were just kind of like, okay, that's a really cool, interesting new technology, but really what did we show? And uh, this sort of reminds me of that. And it's not exactly the same. And I don't want to discount this paper. But the, the reality is, is that, you know, they, they did this incredible amount of work with an unbelievable amount of data to show that basically preterm immune systems catch up and, you know, they're going to be okay for the rest of their life, which I could tell you because my kid gets a vaccine and it's fine. <laughs> and, and, he, and, his, and his arm hurts just like everybody else's arm hurt when they get a Tdap booster or whatever. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, well, it's a great point because I was going to say that that seemed to be the biggest graph in terms of the title and relating it to the significance of the paper. I mean, there are other graphs that are really showing you like, okay, we there are differences in preterm and term immune cell variation than adults. I mean, that really is is what kind of their next point is. And then, you know, these immune cells change over time. And by three months of age, the B cells, natural killer cells and dendritic cell phenotypes look similar to the adults, which, like you said, Cindy, we kind of knew. I don't know if we knew in depth in terms of exactly what cell types and how they change over time. And it kind so of leads to you. Know that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And it does, the, the one thing they noticed that, B, it was B cells, DCs, and NK cells that exhibited a similar phenotype based on a lot of this modeling analysis and phenotypic um, looking at these different topological maps. But T cells did not change. Their differences between adults and infants at three months stayed the same. So there's a lot to go into in terms of T cell differentiation and, and how y you can maybe manipulate that to making sure children maybe respond better to vaccines. So T cells seem to be where they're saying they're not the same as adults at three months. That's true. And, you know, to, to be fair, though, they did, they did talk about in the discussion that, and you mentioned it at the beginning, we talked about the fact that the preterm infants have a very different life during those first three months. You know, the, the term baby, you, you hug your baby, you take it home and, and you, you lay it on the floor and you lay it on blankets and you take it out and you see all these different people and everybody holds the baby and kisses the baby. And the babies who are preterm are in a box. And they, you're lucky if they get touched by, you know, people without gloves and masks. And, you know, the parents maybe, maybe hold them. There's this kangaroo care where you put the, their, their body without clothes against your body to keep them warm and things. But, but they're clearly not exposed to the same environment as a term baby. So the fact that their T cells are slower to develop, I th it may just be that they just aren't exposed to as many things. You know? <laughs> well, and so, that's a great point point because it leads to kind of their, I don't know if a reviewer asked for this or they'd always plan to, but they had fecal samples. And so they looked, yes. of course, at the gut microbiome and found similar things, diversity increases over time, perturbations in, in, in the gut result in these changes that change the phenotype of the cells. So there's dysbiotic versus normal and, 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 and the things that change or maybe things we've identified that they changed before. Um, and maybe that speaks to your point of the preterm infants. I mean, they don't have the same type of colonization. They're treated with more antibiotics. Um, so I think, you know, overall looking at this paper, you, you get, you're kind of bombarded by a lot of data trying to identify what this graph means and what this graph means. But it, the overall picture is that cord blood is different than uh, blood in terms of correlating different phenotypes of cells, that preterm babies move along a convergence of immune cell phenotypes just like their term counterparts, and they end up in a similar spot by day 100, that there are certain populations of cells that end up becoming adult-like by three months of age, BT, mm -hmm. um, B cells, NK cells, DCs, but 
T cells, they they are not, and maybe there's some opportunity for investigation there. And, and so, and then looking at the gut microbiome, they they create this model that it is all these different um, inputs that that put infants on a trajectory of development. And so, at the bottom, they have three different models: the simple model, where you have one input, which is not real life. Of course, you never have one input, one thing that's changing or in your in your body. Um, or you have multiple diverse inputs, and and they suggest that it might not be the type of input. So whether you get ambiotics, whether you're around dogs and allergens, but it's the number of inputs that they're all counteracting and working kind of either against or with each other to move infants along the same path because they they question, well, how could these infants be converging together if they have such different backgrounds or maybe they weren't different enough. I mean, those are all infants from Sweden. They still are in a similarly privileged um, Western world. And maybe if you look at um, different infants from across the world, you, you would see differences. So I, um, I think this paper kind of gives us a, an overview of what systems immunology can do. But now we need to ask maybe more in-depth questions. How do vaccines respond in these babies? How can we develop things for like RSV, rotavirus, all these different types of, of, of pathogens in neonates. So overall, I think I was glad to hear your perspective because I think from a young uh, investigator, I'm sorry, younger scientist who's, I'm like, oh, look at all this data. It's exciting and look at these. But you're right. It, it, it probably is telling you a very similar thing that we already knew. So I appreciate your insight. But- but that. I still think we had to do it because, oh yeah, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty. So this could have been sure, different. Absolutely. Who knows? You know, things could oh, be yeah. different. If you never looked, you don't find it. And I, there I, are new things that they found. It's not like they didn't. Yeah, find of anything. course. I think sure, the cord sure. blood versus blood is really a big deal, right? Yeah, right. Really Telling people just to stop, even like, okay, you you look at cord blood, but then it's like, so what? Yeah, I mean, the other point you make is good. That I would love to see this done with kids who are born on a dirt floor. Right. Right. Yeah. And even, you know, preterm, because that happens in many cultures where kids are not healthy and there there's no box to put them in. And what right. happens? Right. But I think what's good is that a box is okay. It seems to be right because if you think about how it's yep. different from birth happened over a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago. Right. right. Uh, you know, we always worry. Gee, are we <laughs> doing something? Even a C section. You know, we worry that we're not getting the right microbiome but well that still might be the case you know that they they do comment on that that they didn't they did they didn't have enough of uh natural birth versus cesarean to make any comparisons but certainly somebody should do that because there might be really important things there and that the original research that came out about that i i know it has been challenged because it was only 20 mothers that were maybe 10 and 10 and so that whole concept of of the microbiome really changing has been challenged. Mm. So yeah, it would be interesting to to get more in-depth studies of that. So Steph, if you could take one thing from this and do an experiment, what would it be? I would be really interested in the T cell question. Mm. And so understanding how T cells develop over time. And spe- the first three months, I'm fascinated by how... Um, well, milk. So, I mean, I'm really interested in the immune cells of milk and how that could influence. But I would look at the T cell phenotypes and start to introduce um, vaccine antigens to see how they change into pigs into adults. And maybe we need to formulate neonatal vaccines with different adjuvants to take advantage of the different phenotypes of T cells. That that's what I would focus mm. on. Okay. Well, I, if you ask me, you didn't, but I'll volunteer anyway. <laughs> okay. What would you do? <laughs> so, I would ask something that's not in the paper, which is. Did they do RN- did they do RNA seq on the total blood? I don't remember or the cells. They did. They did do some. And I would look like at those, on, those only a couple infants. So I would look at it for viruses. I want to see what viral oh, sequences wow. are present because I'm sure there's some bacteriophages already there. Um, but whether there are eukaryotic viruses, it would be. I would look at that. So that would be a computational uh, experiment. You could just take the data and, yeah. and mine it. Cindy, what would you look at? I, I'm really interested in those individuals that had the, the um, microbiome dysbiosis early and how that correlated with changes in the immune response, because I think that is something that could imprint very early and then change the lifetime uh, immune response of the individual. And so I, I would be very interested to follow that part up. Steph, are you going to 
have any systems work in your postdoc? Do you know? Uh, no, I will not have any. I mean, maybe we'll collaborate, but no, we'll be working um, with maternal and neonatal immunity and developing ways to enhance lactogenic, so milk immunity in a mouse model. So not really so much systems, but I know it would probably be beneficial to know someone who does that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Cause I, I think, I, am I too late? I mean, I just feel like, I don't know, I'd be too late in my training to try to take on some of this. Oh, I don't think so. Not at all. No? Okay. Yeah, no. Certainly as a postdoc, you could do it for sure. Right, right. And it's never too late, really. I could do it even. True. It's just a matter of <laughs> motivation. But I think it's going to be fascinating to follow your career as long as you stay with us on Immune. You know, oh, I'm staying. Over the next year, awesome. through your postdoc, <laughs> you can talk about what's going on. When you publish, we'll talk about it. And then when you get your job, that's cool. We're going to see you. Wow, that would be very cool. It's kind, I... of, it's kind of like this study. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if I converge or if I <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> So, yeah, that's the paper. And I think um interesting. So if you guys... We could probably hit, what do you think, like one email, two emails? Yeah, ah, let's do a couple. Yeah. We want to. I, I just want to say you did a great job with that paper because yeah, that was good. a really complex paper with an incredible amount of data and you distilled that down nicely. So for those people who are listening to this and say, I have no idea what she just said, believe me, it was, it, it was a thousand times more complicated than what she was saying. So she really did a nice job. Thank and you. Steph, I think yes. podcasting is going to help you overall with your whole career, but more specifically with your defense, you're going to just be better at talking about things and going away from your subject because of podcasting. Oh, I agree. I even listened to myself in the first two episodes and even in, you know, what we've done now, 11, 12 total already, I've definitely been more comfortable. So I agree. I think for people interested, science communication helps you in all aspects of science. You bet. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. All right, let's do a couple of emails. And the first one, uh, Cindy, that that's from our last podcast. So why don't you take that from yeah, Andrew? Yeah, great. So Andrew writes, hello, Vincent and Cynthia. And remember, it was because Steph wasn't with us that day. I am really enjoying the immune podcast. As a virologist who wants to be an wants to expand my immunology knowledge, it's perfect for me. I am learning a lot, and I think the way you explain the concepts and experiments is easy to follow and engaging. Your discussions are always fun to listen to. Although Stephanie was not on this particular episode, I very much enjoy hearing her perspective on everything as well. I did have a few comments on episode 11 where you discussed this fascinating new approach to kill to killing staph aureus. If this works, it would be fantastic because prosthetic joint infections are extremely challenging from a clinical infectious disease perspective. They often require lengthy courses of IV antibiotics and repeat surgeries. Most patients with prosthetic joints are elderly and they are often not the best repeat surgery candidates and they often have comorbidities that make long courses of IV antibiotics challenging as well. So if we can prevent these infections or treat them without repeat surgery, it would save a lot of time, money, and morbidity. You mentioned the term sepsis in this episode, and it is often discussed or mentioned in TWIV as well. Sometimes when this term comes up, the discussants seem to equate it with bacteremia, in other words, bacteria in the blood. This is not entirely correct. It is possible to be septic without being bacteremic and vice versa. Influenza can cause sepsis. An intra-abdominal abscess without bacteremia can cause sepsis, and fungi can cause sepsis. I think you get the point. Surprisingly, there's a bit of controversy about how to determine when a patient does or does not have sepsis. This paper, and he puts a link, that came out when I was an intern, redefined the clinical parameters we use to determine sepsis, but I don't think it has been accepted with unanimous enthusiasm. Regardless, the authors did provide a word definition, which I quite like. Sepsis is defined as life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. I want to stop there for a minute because I learned sepsis is equated to bacteria in the blood. And I, my interpretation of what he's describing is really a cytokine storm mm. or a systemic inflammation response. But I guess, you know, in the medical community, perhaps they're redefining it so that it's not so restrictive. I don't know what you guys have to think about that. Well, if you go to CDC or Mayo Clinic online, they all define it as like a cytokine storm. Right. 
not specifically mm-hmm. bacteremia, but the consequence of having a systemic infection, which goes beyond bacteria, as as Andrew said. So right. So so he is right, and so we'll we'll consider. I will definitely consider redefining that as we move forward and being more specific to calling bacteremia bacteremia, not sepsis. So um, he continues on to correct me again <laughs> and says, <laughs> finally, <laughs> finally, vancomycin was mentioned as an antibiotic to treat MRSA infections. It is true that it is our go-to MR- MRSA drug. However, there are other antibiotics that have activity against MRSA that can be used depending on the clinical scenario. Also, the CDC does not specifically restrict the use of vancomycin. Each hospital is supposed to have an antimicrobial stewardship program, which determines how and which antibiotics are restricted so as to ensure that every patient patient gets the right antibiotic at the right dose for the right length of time. At my hospital, for example, most of the time when a clinician wants to prescribe vancomycin, they need to get approval from an infectious disease pharmacist or an infectious disease fellow attending to do so. So it says, keep up the excellent work. You're providing a great service to both the scientific community and the public. I'm encouraging all of my relatives to listen to the CAR T cell episode, because when you hear it all explain, it's like science fiction come to life. Cheers, Andrew. So thank you, Andrew, for correcting me. You know, we do our best. I, I, you know, I don't know everything. And, you know, as we were just talking about, we get better at talking outside of our little sphere of expertise. And so sometimes we're going to be wrong. And I, I think that's okay. For yeah, sure, I think. Sure. And I'm glad and people I, are listening, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I think people that's why the public appreciates these podcasts. At least I've heard emails written into TWIV. You know, when they hear scientists admitting, oh, I, I was wrong. This is how science works. It, it makes it more relatable. So sure. Yeah. It, it breaks down the notion that we're inscrutable and we don't ever admit we're wrong. And that helps. I think it's important for people to know that. Now, Andrew, I'm going to put a link in the show notes. Andrew was on TWIV 185. Oh, and the picture in that episode is Andrew sitting uh, inside a little fort that he built of plaque assays. <laughs> so that's Andrew there. That's when he was uh, in the MD PhD st- program there at Northwestern, and he showed me this picture, and that's what inspired me to build the wall of polio. Oh, really? So I, I didn't, I thought maybe it would have been the opposite that you had at first, but he was no, the one no, that no. inspired he, you. This is May, 2012. And he said, look at this. And I said, Oh, I, that is cool. We have some plates and we have to do that. So th- it was Andrew's inspiration for sure. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, Steph, can you take the next one? Steen. Yes. Yeah, Steen. Let me get down here. Okay, so Dear Immune Trifecta, I enjoyed talking to all three of you at ASV 2018, and Steen even took our group photo, so thank you to Steen. I have a listener pick of sorts, a video summary of some history and recent developments in plant pathology. That's awesome. I haven't checked it out yet, but I will. Plant pathology is an area of expertise on my campus I'm at here, and I have a lot of friends interested in that, so that's great. The video accompanies a recently published perspective piece. Um, It's not open access, sadly, but available in PDF from the authors. I actually don't like the emphasis on complexity, and I would quibble with the way they use the word model. I prefer scenario, but overall, it's a nice and accessible summary. So if I go ahead and open this, what Steen has sent us um, is a science Mag- magazine article on receptor networks that underpin plant immunity. And <laughs> we might need a guest if, if we want to do an episode on plant immunity because I do not know a lot. But it's fascinating. I think a lot of plant people would enjoy that. Oh, we should definitely do some plant immunity. Yeah. yeah that would be yeah. neat. <clears throat> we'll see if we can handle it. If not, yeah, Steen will, t- I'm sure, be happy to join us by Skype. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Last one is from Jolene. Howdy, immuners. I found this article in the Journal of the American Medical Association left on my desk recently. It describes a deck-building card game that teaches the immune system. In the game, you are a bacterial pathogen that must overcome the, the human defenses, including innate and adaptive responses. I'm always interested to hear about creative ways to teach immunology and thought this might fit the bill sometime in the future, perhaps for a review session. Anyone else heard of the game or used it? 
And so she links to uh, the article describing this game. Pathogenesis, a new deck building game. And uh, a video also describing it. This is the first time I've seen this. Looks cool. Me too. But yeah, this me too. So cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a card I love game. it. It's really good. I'm so such a geek this way. <laughs> I love it. If anyone has tried it, let us know. Yeah. There's also a video. Awesome. Now Jolene is um, a friend of Twiv. She does actually the um, the timestamps for Twiv, and she has volunteered oh. to also do them for Immune. Oh, Aww. thank you, Jolene. That's so nice. And I mean, it's a little less complicated because we usually have one paper and, <laughs> and one link. But <laughs> nevertheless, thank you, Jolene. All right, let's move to finally some picks of the week. Steph, what do you have for us? Yeah, sure. So um, I have a friend who he's a postdoc at UNC in, I think, Stan Lemon's lab. Uh, I don't know. If, I think that's true. I'm looking at his profile right now. It's not saying it. But anyways, he takes beautiful pictures, micrographs. of. He works in virology, and he posts these on Twitter, and he just started an open access educational project to showcase um, microscopy pictures from anyone, and it's called Kaleidoscopine, um, and it's new, and he's looking for people to submit micrographs for this open access educational project. So if you're interested... I don't have his email right now. I will get that for you. But his Twitter is at Naked Capsid. And you can send him your micrographs if you want them included in that project. So I think it's it's great. And and it seems that, as with any, most art, it really helps to bring in um, people who are not in science these really beautiful pictures. So mm -hmm. I'd recommend that. Yeah, between now and posting this, maybe, <laughs> excuse me, maybe you can get... Um... There's so, is there a website for Kaleidoscopian or? I just Googled it. it. Not quite yet, but maybe he's working on it. Yeah, he must be working on it. So he just posted on Twitter kind of this call that he's. Yeah, I saw that. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll put so his I'll, Twitter in. in. Yeah. Right. And I'll get an email. Sure. Okay. Cindy, what do you have for us? So my pick is a group called 500 Women Scientists, and um, this is all, all over the world, but each uh, city can have its own little, what they call a pod, and I discovered that Ithaca has a pod, and uh, I went to a meeting the other night, and one of the things we're trying to do is locally um, get information to and from people who are running for political office to inquire about what their views are on issues that are important to scientists and women in science. And so um, we have we had local elections, primaries here the other day, and the, the regular election, midterm elections are coming up, as many of you know. Go out and vote. Um, so uh, we, we're trying to you know, ask questions and get information back from these so we can distribute it to women scientists in the area and also to help try and get out the vote because it's so, it's so very important, but this is a, you know, it doesn't cost anything to join. You can go to their website and learn more about what they, what they're interested in and what they want to do. And if there's a local chapter in your area and it's not just women in science, it's also women who are, um, supporting women in science, former women scientists, and also men who are interested in promoting women in science as well. Awesome. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Hey, this is a democracy, folks. Vote. Vote. <laughs> vote. Democracies vote. only work if you vote. Exactly. All right. That's cool. Well, my article is a short, um, my pick is a short article on the latest spending bill that needs to be approved soon, otherwise the government will shut down. And this bill is interesting because it includes an increase for the NIH budget, $2.3 billion, which would be the second year in a row that the budget's gone up. And this is really good because, you know, the NIH budget, which supports most or a great deal of biomedical research in this country, is about $35 billion. And that sounds like a lot of money, but it's really, for what NIH does, it's really very little. And it right. it should really be $100 billion. Um, mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, this country has lots of things to spend money on. So it's going up, and that's great. It is part of a bill that includes funding for the military, and they did that on purpose. So, that, so the final thing now that has to be done is the president has to sign this. Mm -hmm. And... If the president does not, you know, it doesn't look good because he is 
not funding the military, which is always a popular thing politically, right? right. So right. they've linked them together, and the Republicans are not very happy about this, especially conservative Republicans. Nevertheless, $2.3 billion increase for uh, NIH is great, so hopefully yeah. it will get signed. And this is good because, you know, even though it's kind of earmarked for, uh, there are two things they want to earmark it for, universal flu vaccine and antimicrobial resistance. Mm -hmm. It Mm -hmm. still goes into the coffers and I think helps people in funding difficulties as well. So it's a really important bill. So that's cool. You know, despite the bad political climate, NIH has been doing pretty well, which is good. You know, because it is viewed as a jewel by Congress, which is great. It is not political. It makes your life better. It makes science, and that's what we all need. So I right. think that's that's the one cool thing about politics these days. There's not much, but they still support science. <laughs> <laughs> well, for now. <laughs> yeah, for now. You never know, right? You never Keep know. Keep your fingers crossed. Right. Well, if they don't, people will start dying, you know. And they'll learn that way. It's not a good way to learn, but... All right, that's immune number 12. When did we start immune? Mike, let's take a look. September. Uh, Yeah. Was it September in uh, 2017? Pretty sure. Let me me look here. I want to see... Because we haven't skipped a month. Yeah, immune was... We have not. Immune number one was released on November 1st, so... Okay. uh, Oh, okay. Not quite our first. Maybe we recorded in... October and then... Yeah, probably. Anyway, so it's about a year, so 12 episodes. There you go. You can find it at microbe.tv slash immune, Apple Podcasts, pretty much everywhere finer podcasts are are delivered. And, (laughs) you know, if you have a phone or a tablet and that's how you listen on an app, you can just subscribe. You'll get every episode automatically. There's just one a month. It's not a big deal. It's not going to fill up your device. And it helps us that you subscribe even if you don't want to support us financially, which I'm going to ask you to do next, at least subscribe so that we can get our numbers higher. And if you like what we do, go to microbe.tv slash contribute, and we have ways that you give as little as a dollar a month to uh, help us with our expenses. And, of course, questions and comments to immune at microbe.tv. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University on Twitter. She's Cindy Leifer. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Steph Langle is at Ohio State University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thanks, Steph. Good to have you back. Thanks. Yeah, great to be back. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws, P-R-O-F-E-R-R on Twitter. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal, stevenealpercussion.com. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month.